Let us begin this morning with prayer. Heavenly Father, we have so many blessings that uh, you've, you've given to us and entrusted us with, and, and we pray that we would be good stewards of these blessings, yet the reality is sometimes we let them become too important and sometimes prioritize them over you. Uh, be with us in our study of idols we never knew we had, as today we look at success and how this blessing of, of being successful in life can sometimes, too, become too much of a of a factor in our lives if it replaces the glory that is that is owed to you. Uh, be with us and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. That's what we're looking at. Uh, if you were able to pull up the worksheets, that's good. I'll pull them up as we work through two. Uh, lesson two, idols we never knew we had on success. So I'm just gonna close our door here. So give me one second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at this background, Leanne. Look at it. I even found the background for the Bible class here. See? And we're going to be up at the success corner up there. So, oh, see, so yeah, took all that time. Hi, Jacob. No, he's connecting yet. Let's go to the worksheet. And there, there's an opening that uh, this comes again from Pastor James Hine. And I just want to read that as an, as an opening here. To explain, because when you look at the different list of idols, sports, technology, politics, love, you know, success is probably one, even being the first specific idol that we, we are looking at. Sometimes is, it, it maybe it seems a little vague, but I, I like how Pastor Hine explains it. I want to read through that opening that you, we have, and I put it on the screen for you. We all want to win. We all want validation in life. Why is that? Some people would say, well, we're just competitive, but there's more to it. Who hasn't played a board game or party game with a supposed grown-up who, when she, I like how it uses the feminine word she, meaning the guys don't do this, women do not, doesn't mean that, but when he or she performs poorly, whines, complains, and pouts like a baby. Uh, when my son was little, no matter who won after a game to try to teach him good sportsmanship, we were supposed to shake hands and say, good game. And I know that was not always done with the most uh, uh, happiness, you know, how little kids hate to lose and how we're even told to let little kids win sometimes. But sometimes as adults, notice what we do the same thing, act like a baby. Suddenly, loss communicates to this person that she hasn't learned enough in this life to be considered smart. You know, you think of any games, even if they're simple dice games or chance games, still how we take that personally. Or it says, we've played softball with the middle-aged guy who takes things way too seriously and is an embarrassment to everyone present. Yeah, that's probably me. I don't think I took it that seriously, though. Suddenly, Lost communicates to this guy that he's slowing down, deteriorating, and maybe never was quite as good as he thought that, at least in his own mind, he's a loser. Maybe always has been a loser. I did have to talk with a vicar years ago about uh, the attitude playing church softball. He was a little too intense. And I said, we're out here, if nothing else, you and I are to keep things light and not let people take this too seriously. But I, I remember he kind of got caught up a little too much in it. So uh, I had to tell him this does not validate your life, whether you're a winner or loser by how you perform in co-ed softball, or maybe it was just men's league at the time. These may be simplistic examples, but this desire for success exists in more complex forms that are very real in many of our lives. Every human assumes success should be part of his or her world. Perhaps this is a holdover from creation where prosperity, abundance, and satisfaction were the norm. But with the world's collapse into sin, this is no longer the case. We really have a hard time believing that in this world, the evil ultimately outweighs the good. But it's true. That's why we all eventually die. That's also why God eventually will destroy this planet in its current form. The only reason God preserves it for now is for the sake of his people, whom scripture calls the salt, that is the preservative of the earth. I, I found that interesting to break down when you think of how upset we get when we don't succeed at something, almost as if success is a guarantee or is a right of, or a privilege or something that 
should be the expectation. And, and I've noticed to just give a, a, again, a sports analogy. Why is it that if our sports teams wins, wins, we don't, our sports teams win, we don't rejoice as much as we lament the fact when they lose because we expect them to win and we expect to be successful. But if they lose or if we don't accomplish something, then we tend to take it personally. And then we tend to, um, then we tend to let it kind of get to us. So I, I think there is, there is some, uh, you'll find some good things in this study about how success can become so vital to us that it takes a position in our life to which it really doesn't belong. So any thoughts on that opening before we get into one of the main scripture uh, sections for this morning? Let's continue then. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, 21 through 26, and that's printed out for you on the sheet. So I'll just pull that up again. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul. And, then it, and it has a note here on the next page. In context, this conversation occurs shortly before Jesus is about to enter what in some respects is both the most successful and the least successful portion of his ministry. Uh, this was the transfiguration would follow and then his final trip to Jerusalem where if you understand what, what's being said there, most successful because it followed God's plan exactly as God wanted it to. Least successful in the eyes of the disciples and others is saying, wow, what could be worse than to have uh, our, our rabbi, our master seized and tried and then have to be put to death on the cross. So uh, that's, that's why that note is there. Let's go into our discussion questions. The first one, religious people are often inclined to believe that if they're well-behaved, God will or should bless them. How does this text, what we just read, destroy the idea that failure and suffering must be the direct result of unfaithfulness? How does this text destroy, the, destroy that idea that if you fail or suffer, it has to be because you're unfaithful, using what we have about Jesus there? Anyone have a thought on that? God takes and uh, has all things. If you're failing, if you fail at something, it's uh, God's will that you do fail, and it's to teach you a lesson. God's always going to use it for our good. He's going to teach us through that, that failing. Maybe we need to fail to be kept close to him. And, and what, I guess, what comfort or reinforcement do we get from reading about uh, what was about to happen to Jesus when we're talking about failure? Was there anyone more faithful in obeying God than Jesus? <laughs> So if, if, you know, and this is why that statement was made, if you're judging it from the outside and you say, look at what happened to Jesus, this ultimate failure that ended up on a cross, then you'd have to say, um, it isn't the result of him being unfaithful. So things that we go through, there may not be a direct correlation if we fail to succeed to say, well, that's because we're unfaithful. That's because God is punishing us. Um, you can't, every time someone uh, fails to do something, 
that isn't to say, well, it must be the direct result because of something they've done. Now, I think of back in playing football in high school and college that in getting ready for games, we'd say, okay, we're going to stay out another half hour because we, we want to be successful. And you'd hear these speeches about, you know, the teams that fail in the fourth quarter are those that aren't trained or are, don't have the stamina. And I get that too. And so maybe in sports, you, people will try to find a direct reason for why, you know, why they lost. And yet you'll hear players and managers sometimes say, they were just better than we were. <laughs> I don't think the people that are taking notes for the newspaper or, for, or articles online really like those kind of quotes because they want a reason. Well, you know, why did you lose that, that big lead? Or, or why did you uh, have that breakdown in the ninth inning? And, uh, you know, is it because you don't have good enough players or you weren't trained right or you didn't practice or you don't have the right managers? Uh, it's really kind of interesting when managers or coaches get fired. They're usually not the problem. But even we as sports fans have said, my team's losing, fire the coach, fire the manager. And sometimes it's just, hey, they're just better. And in life for us, every time something doesn't succeed, doesn't mean that we are unfaithful in following our God and somehow he's letting us down. And I think that's what, what that first point is all about. So thoughts on that? Look at, look at Peter. The second one talks about how Peter responded because Peter right away, it says, how does this text specifically Peter's behavior adjust the way we encourage others who are experiencing failure or suffering in life? What was, what was Peter's reaction again? We go up here a little bit. Never Lord, this shall never happen to you. And I'm not going to let it happen. So think about that question. How does this text, especially Peter's behavior, adjust the way we encourage others we're experiencing failure or suffering in life. Well, to begin with, you can't stop it from happening and it's going to happen. You're right on, Roy. That's, that's it. And, and Peter was saying, it's not going to happen. We're not going to let it happen. We can't say that to people. You know, you're saying that, Roy. It, sometimes it's just going to happen. Who else has a thought on that question about uh, how we encourage others who might be experiencing failure or suffering in life. You can console them, tell them to learn from it. Yeah, and, and not always to say uh, you must be doing something wrong because we're not, we don't always know the causes of failure or suffering, why it's happening, and, and we can't pretend that we do. I mean, sometimes it might, if you're, if you're talking to someone who's lost his job and his marriage is, is in trouble because he's an alcoholic and he refuses to get any help. Okay, then you can come a little stronger with the law and you can talk about there's reasons why this is happening. But in most cases, we, we don't know what's causing it or why they might be going through it, nor should we presume to know the, the outcome other than to say, God is with you. He hasn't forsaken you. He won't give you more than you can handle. And he says that this is even going to work out for, for good. Um, part of our understanding with the world in which we live in is that we're all going to suffer because it's a sinful world. But um, especially as Christians, if you remember what Jesus says, he says, everyone will hate you because of me. So our attachment to Jesus is going to bring us a different brand of suffering so sometimes we'll know the cause. It's because we stand up for what, what Christ says is, is right. But for the most part, don't, uh, when you're, don't be like Peter to say, oh, this isn't going to happen. It can't possibly happen to you because it can. Like Roy said, I mean, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. And you don't always have to attach a reason to it. If a loved one of yours gets cancer, don't, don't try to figure it out other than to say, you know, I'll pray for you and God's with you. And, and God will take care of you. I mean, that's all you can really say. And that's, that's good. Just don't do be doing too much can. like Peter. Do it's not going to happen. Can. Roy, go ahead. Do the best you can. Yeah. And, and, and it's okay. We don't need to know the outcome and we don't need to know the cause. And, and uh, if we have to dig for it, then we don't need to talk about it. But like I said, with an example of an alcoholic, if you know something they're doing that's bringing it about, well, then you're, you're within your rights to say, and let's talk about why this might be happening. Let's go on and kind of tying all this into, into success. So we don't know why some aren't successful. That's just how it is. And, and number three, 
in general terms, how does the world tend to measure success in life? What does it look like? And what does it say about us as Christians if we pursue those measurables with the same level of desire? Let's start out with the first part. How does the world tend to measure success in life or, or what does it look like by money. worldly standards? They, they judge you on the money you make. Material wealth. That's going to be one that jumps out right away, that they're going to look and say, wow, you know, and, and we judge ourselves by a, a growing bank account. Others will look and say, look at that nice home. Hey, look at the new vehicles they have. Um, what are some other things that, that the world tends to, me how they measure, the world measures success in life? We go with, with material things. Fame. I'm sorry, Ray, what was that? Fame. Fame, yeah, kind of your, your status or, you know, how well known you are, how successful you are using that word success in, in uh, your career. Um, what kind of credentials you have, maybe the, the degrees that you might have, uh, how many people work underneath you, uh, the kind of office you have, if you, you're kind of risen up the ladder. Uh, what else do we use to measure success? Whether you're happy or not. Okay. Um, some of that might, and yeah, that, that might even lean towards something we would be in favor of. If you're content, that's success. Um, I, how, how do you respond to when, when you see someone that seems to have it all and yet someone will say they just don't seem to be happy? So is it, am I, am I hearing right from you, Roy, and anyone else with thoughts on this, that if you're, if you're successful in the eyes of the world, it doesn't always equate to being happy? That's right. You can, take, you can be a poor man and you can be happy. Yeah. You can be a so, rich man and you can be unhappy. And there's some people in the world that just won't get it because they just don't see it that way. They'll just see if someone is, is, is successful by these standards that we talked about. Um, and, and, and I got the follow-up to that question. Um, he said, what does it say about us as Christians if we pursue those measurables with that same level of desire, if that's how we see success? What does is, what is that then uh, say for us as Christians? You know, it tells me that, it, that if you're following the world's example, you're, you're chasing the almighty dollar instead of God. And that idea that we had from Matthew, if you gain the whole world, yet you forfeit your soul. So everything that truly has value, you could lose. If you make success your God, or you make, your, make success your idol, and... Uh, you know, that, that comes in a, no, in a number of different formats, too, when you talk about, well, how does that trump over what, what God would have you do? It may involve maybe not always following scriptural uh, guidelines and how you conduct yourself at work. It could mean, um, you know, that the fact that if I understand that there's times when people you know, have to miss uh, worship because of work and things like that. Uh, but I, I'm also very strong in saying if it becomes more of a habit or more of the norm, you maybe have to reevaluate a little bit. Um, I, I kind of, I've approached the same thing about teach, what, what we teach our children with uh, activities on weekends that knock out a lot of Sundays. It may happen from time to time with the occasional tournament, but uh, when, if you look at the schedule and you find out before you join a team that this is going to be the norm, that almost every Sunday morning they're going to be somewhere, and uh, playing on Sunday morning, so you couldn't even go to a church service, one of our Wells churches out of town, then you kind of say, what do our kids learn from that? So uh, again, it doesn't make you a blatant heathen, but sometimes are you teaching success to your children? Maybe that's gonna fall under the other categories of sports and whatever else we had up there too, um, things we love. But uh, success often takes uh, a main role in all of this that it shouldn't. I like this next sec next section that you guys can help me out a little bit. Doesn't mean you can only answer in regards to the category that pertains to you, but uh, looking at number four on the next page. In more specific terms, our particular idols of success may tend to change based on variables like age or gender. And I emphasize using generalizations, what idol of success comes to mind 
for each of the following groups. And Pastor Hine had some suggestions that I'll offer after I, I talk with you a little bit. And, it, and as I looked at his, I, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, validity to how he categorizes it. But for example, you're a young adult man. What idea of success comes to your mind as a young adult man? And again, does it mean that you have to be a young adult man? But what is considered success for someone um, who's a male and who's young? Where do they find success? That does make us think on a little bit on this too, so. I'm finding someone to marry getting your life on the right track, you know, and, um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, trying to establish yourself as, as saying this is the next role in, in life. So that's one thing. What are some other things a young adult man would say is their barometer or measuring mark of success? Finding a good job. Okay. Some of it is, is job related. I was going to say education. You know, I, that, that's one that, that Pastor Hine had down, Janice, said academics. You know, I've got to get my education because that's going to lead to the job and to the family. So maybe, you know, for, foremost is, you know, I got to get that degree. And, and along with it, and, and, if we, and we're going probably before they get out of school, the, one of the other things Pastor Hine mentioned is athletics that these are the ones that get caught up in, in sports, whether they're participating or rooting on, that that's a measuring stick of how successful they are, uh, how they do athletically. And if you go to the young adult woman, you, I think you can carry over academics because I think now that's fair. It isn't a point of, you know, now I'm going to, I'm just going to um, end up getting married to stay at home. No, I think it's just as important for women today. And, and so a young adult woman would say, find a good college, find a good school, get a career, things like that. What else though, maybe different from the young adult man would a, a, a woman look for that to measure success? A good husband. <laughs> Along <laughs> the same lines of trying to find some, it's kind of closely related. And, and, and I think when you, um, and I, when I, I didn't think of this right away either because, well, I'm not, uh, I'm not a young adult woman, so I didn't realize this. But Pastor Hines said, and, and again, he doesn't want to overgeneralize, but he said, beauty means more to a young woman than it does to a young man. That young women will want to be perceived as being attractive more so than guys will. Guys want to be athletic. They want to fit in. Uh, a young woman will want to say it really matters to be attractive. And so that would be maybe a, a measure of success to, to say, as long as I, you know, to find a husband or to find uh, those, of, uh, those of the opposite sex that would be interested in me. Guys would probably try to prove themselves by how athletic they are, or what they can accomplish. Women more so on what they look, look like, so. But then we're gonna move to the middle-aged man. This is maybe, you know, you're getting to your 40s and 50s. A middle-aged man, what is going to measure success or be considered a level or a measurement of success by a middle-aged man? His income. I think you're looking at, I think you're right. We get, we get and men in general get a lot of self-esteem from the jobs that they do. Uh, when you get to middle age and you say, okay, I've got my, I've got my position, I have my job. Now I'm gonna be concerned about the, the fact of, you know, having this position. Jacob, the McCulloch say family. You know, I'm, uh, I'm gonna, I think you're right to a certain extent, uh, Jacob, Rachel, but you're gonna find out more so with the middle-aged woman. Family and family health and wellness is more important, or that's what they see as having the family. I look at my wife with um, how she works with our family, with Thomas and Kristen being here and how that's so key to have them and, and, to, and to do things with them. And, and I'm thinking with me, I'm talking with Thomas, we're talking about you know, his, his new church and, and looking more at the career trajectory about, okay, you're gonna get established with the new church. Um, for me, that's important to say, get established there, get established in ministry. Whereas my wife is more about the family, about getting things set up, 
and having a whole, you know, the, what's the house like? And, uh, and you're not going to be working maybe for a while, Kristen. So how are things going to play out that way? Uh, and, and, and I see that consistent probably with my wife and, and myself just in general that uh, I'll be more, in, and, and that, that can cause some problems. And I've seen this in marriage counseling where men are maybe more career minded, especially in middle age, where women are more talking about family. And then you usually have middle age where your children are getting, you're getting to be in that empty nest stage and your children are finding a, a spouse and they're starting their own family. And that becomes so important. And that moves us into the older age. What does an older aged man see as success? And Leanne, don't, don't say that's me, Leanne. I'm still middle aged, I think. So don't be saying, well, what do you think, Bastard? No, I'm I, middle aged. <laughs> when I'm 60, I'll be older, I think. Maybe then I'll be older, older aged man. But what do you think in here is where someone, let's, let's say they get to, you know, okay, say my age, 60 or so, what's going to be a level of success you you you've kind of you, you've you know lived your lived a good chunk of the the heyday of your life and it's not maybe so much on your career, career trajectory because you see where it's taking you what now okay you've got a good job you've got everything going and as time you need to really start looking at your retirement plans okay you're looking at your career and and you're starting to say okay am i set up Am I, am I set up for the future? And some will talk about, and I don't know, you guys tell me that, that if this, some say that you get that feeling later in life about a legacy, what's the legacy you're leaving behind? I, you know, I don't know. I haven't really, what's all, what's all involved in a legacy? What are we talking about there? Like what you'll be remembered for? Maybe if we're talking in a worldly viewpoint, that might be more of an influence. Me, you know, I, I hope some people remember my name, especially if they're related to me. But other than that, I don't know if I have to have a lasting legacy. Because I don't know if I know really what that means, unless I'm missing the boat here. If it's a legacy that he faithfully served a congregation, was a good father and husband, okay. But maybe more so if you don't really have an eternal future in mind, maybe that does become more important, that you made an impact on this world somehow. Uh, Mark and Lori. I was going to say helping your kids be successful. That, yeah, and I think that's maybe that's along the lines, too, of legacy with your children. And that, that kind of bleeds into the older age woman uh, always uh, is going to maybe lean towards this idea of multiple generations because you're going to have the grandkids. And I've seen that now in some classmates that uh, have grandkids and my wife encouraging my son and daughter saying, when are we getting grandkids? You know, that kind of thing. And, and overall family stability, because you, you become as an older age woman, more so of the matriarch, you know, the patriarch is still kind of working to into re, on retirement and making sure that family union unit is solid. Where I always see the matriarch, the, the grandmother type you know, getting the older age woman who now has, uh, young grandchildren perhaps coming along, that family stability becomes, you know, so because you like to keep track of how many grandkids you have. And I have one classmate, he, he got married right out of college. I think he was one of the first ones in our class to actually get married. Back then, you used to wait till you're, you know, sometime during your seminary career. Now there's, it's like my son got married right out of college, but it was kind of rare, a little bit more rare for pastors back then. But he got married the summer after we graduated from college, and they started having kids right away. And I think they have five or six kids, but they all have now gotten married. One or two are in ministry, too. And I think almost all of them, or, or many of them, they have grandkids. And my, my wife is friends with the, the wife on Facebook, and she's always talking about the grands. She calls them the grands. And, and, and they're all spread out but they still make it a point to try to get home or try to get together. And, and that, that seems to be her highlight in life, being surrounded by grandkids or by grandchildren. And that's what made me think too, of this family stability, the know that your family is doing well, uh, they're, they're following a path that is going to be God pleasing and it's going to be blessed and they're going to be taken care of. So um, that, that comes in. So, I, what's being brought out here is that we have different things in life that become more important to us. 
and we probably see that in life. And it's always again interesting watching the generation following us and trying to relay to my son some of the things my father relayed to me before I got in ministry. It's kind of a surreal kind of thing about, okay, this may not be real important to you right now, Tom, but here's one of the key things uh, to establish in ministry and, and just kind of passing on some things like that. A anyone else have um, uh, thoughts on that little exercise? Just to show you that we have different measurements for success. Uh, the world even sees it depending on our gender and our age. The thing that ten tends to come out in families is the older the kids get, the smarter you get. <laughs> It is a wonderful thing that uh, I'm not even sure when that happens, Roy. I, I, that uh, I'm trying to think when it happened with Thomas, uh, Mark, and Lori. Do you know when all of a sudden your kids started thinking that you might maybe actually know something? Uh, not so far. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, or hasn't that happened yet? Because uh, sometimes I, you got to kind of look for it, like with Thomas, that if if. Imitation is the highest uh, form of flattery or, or saying that, yeah, dad, that's, yeah, that is, that does make sense. Or that is a good way to do it. Cause I said to him, I, you know, I was working on the bulletin yesterday and getting this ready. And I said, Tom, uh, if you ever, you know how to put a bulletin together? And he goes, no, I haven't yet. And I go, Whoa, you went through, I said, I said, uh, you know, this takes a little planning and work. He goes, yeah, I'll figure it out. Fuck. <laughs> I said, Tom, I, I hope you do. Is there any sense of urgency I'm instilling in you? But every once in a while, you see them doing something or alter or or altering their the way they do something based on what they've seen in you. And you think, okay, they may not verbally always say, you know, hey, Dad, Mom, you really knew what you're talking about. But we, I think we've all gone through that. We said, man, our parents actually knew some things, and we didn't always give them credit for that. So, oh, let's go to the next one. Number, come on, there we go. According to Jesus, true discipleship requires a willingness to do what? From verses 24 through 26. Let's just go back. And I'm thinking it's, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So what would you say um, Jesus is saying there? True discipleship requires a willingness to do what? To follow his word. Yeah. Um, deny, what does it mean to deny yourself? Take up your cross and You're follow. You're not going to go the easy route. You're going to do the right route. Denying yourself, yeah. Um, you got to sometimes say no to what you think is important or what maybe your nature, which is scarred by sin, might be saying. You, you might have to say, I, I want to put, I, I have to put Jesus first in my life more than success. And so it might, might involve sacrifice, denying yourself. I'm going to deny myself this dessert because I'm trying to lose a few pounds. That means you're sacrificing <laughs> or giving up dessert. Thomas, you know, and it's special occasion, but he goes, do you guys have dessert for, for lunch and dinner? No, Thomas, not always. Cause he said, I'm trying to lose some weight here. You know, Thomas is so huge, you know, so, uh, but he says, he says, I'm not going to have dessert for, for lunch. You'll deny yourself. So if you're going to sacrifice something, that means you're willing to, you know, experience failure, uh, suffering and rejection. You're willing to do that from the world to be, you know, denying what the world maybe thinks you should do because you're going to say, I'd rather do that than deny Christ. So uh, I think when well, that's because he goes right into saying, if you gain the whole world, you got the world's acceptance, you have success by worldly standards. If you have all of that, but you over, end up forfeiting your soul, what good is it? So isn't it better to deny yourself or to make sure you don't put anything above Christ in order that you still have your soul and your savior? So, yeah. Well, I have a lot of people that are older than I am telling me I'm too old to be doing meals on wheels. Mm -hmm. And I've got people to tell me it's good for me. And I, I'm in reasonably good health. I enjoy doing it. It helps older people. And so, therefore, I do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's good for me. 
Yeah. Man, and it's it's kind of like Christian attitude too. You're taking care of other people. Sure. And and that is expressing that, and that's a God pleasing <laughs> thing. And and it, uh, it isn't anything that's causing you to sacrifice any of your faith or faithfulness to Christ. So it's a good thing. It's actually serving Him. Good. Last one we have here, number six. Uh, Jesus himself loathed the idea of apparent worldly failure. Uh, in fact, he even consulted his heavenly father about it in prayer. But in the end, he chose earthly loss, which was the will of God. How has this decision affected his? De how has this decision affected us? What does it teach us about <laughs> in life? How does the lasting impact of Jesus' decision affect our approach to the idea of success? Um, it, it kind of get you know be, you got uh, kind of by way of explanation because there's a lot in there. If you think about it, because of Jesus now he was perfect, and yet he chose. I think we it's 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 true. He chose to experience suffering and loss in our place, and thereby that's how he paid for all our sins. And some of those sins include loving worldly success more than God. And that's so he paid for those sins. He opened heaven for us. Um, going all the way back to how Peter could not possibly view what Jesus would be undergoing as successful. And his main, the only thing that came to his mind was never, this will never happen. This will, this, I won't let it happen. Jesus came out of the grave and that apparent failure then Remember how the disciples uh, still reeling in the fact that this is the worst thing that ever happened, how unsuccessful Jesus was. And, and I think they probably, if you would ask them point blank, did Jesus succeed? Did your master succeed? They said, how could he succeed when everything was taken from him? Even that same night, how they were hiding in fear. But when we talk about Jesus coming back on this earth for, for 40 days, and how he taught the disciples, and they even needed Pentecost finally to see that all the apparent failures that happened to Jesus were, were just an illusion because they were successful. Now, you take that into our lives today. What's, when you think of the illusions of failure, what's the worst thing that people will tell you can happen to you? Worst thing. Worst thing that can happen to you? Yeah, that people in the world will say the worst thing that could happen to you on this earth would be to. Stop being on this earth to die, right? You guys see that? Mm -hmm. if, if someone you said the worst thing that could happen to you would be to die. Now. That ain't necessarily true. For us, we know it isn't. But for people in the world, they say no matter what you have, because. Because what will people say? That they'll say, at least you have your health. Like, that's the most important thing because the worst thing is to lose your health and ultimately the very worst thing would be to die. Now, you and I have been conditioned by God's word with the promises of God's word that know that death in this life by the power of God, the illusion of death being the worst thing that is possible, we know that even in death we are successful. And so the loss we experience in this life uh, due to our attachments to Jesus, whatever we may lose in this life are not your really failures, are not really losses, because we know what they bring us. We know being faithful to our Lord allows us to uh, still reap the benefits of heaven from believing what he's done for us. And when you think about success, could you say right now to anyone in the world that as a Christian, that guarantees I'm a success? Is that okay to say? And could you could you say something like that? Yeah, we'll take a look at me. I'm, I'm in fairly good health, not the best of health, but I, I'm uh, doing all right. I've got God. I've got my church, and I've got my family. What more do I need? So you're successful, correct? Yeah. So. Twisting it just a little bit more, you know, there are a lot of people, I've talked to people that, uh, I, I'm, I've told you too, I, I'm not a big fan of having a bucket list. I just don't have a lot of things in life that I need to accomplish. 
Um, and I joke that I don't have a bucket list. I have a Dixie cup list, you know, mine's really small or whatever. I told, I was telling Thomas and Kristen, grandkids would be kind of cool. I'd like to have grandkids. There it is. My one thing I have, but you, you look at that statement of people have a bucket list of what they want to accomplish in life. And there's nothing wrong with having goals. There's nothing wrong with saying, here's what I'd like to accomplish. But do we as Christians recognize Truly, there's nothing more for us to accomplish because we are already successful in the fact that we know about Jesus. Do you see the comfort that can be in that statement and that can just maybe let you let out that sigh that things are going to be okay, even if you don't have the best job or even if you don't have the best home or the nicest things. And, and even if your health isn't the greatest, you can say that I'm successful I really don't have much more in life to accomplish, if anything, because Jesus has accomplished everything for me. And then we simply step back, kind of echoing what you said, Roy. I have everything I need. I can simply rest in that joy of anticipating uh, the experience of Jesus' success, Ex anticipate when, when I'm with him that we can look forward to that. But as far as accomplishing it, it's already been accomplished. That's what makes us, us Lutherans. Too many are out there saying you still have to accomplish your relationship with God and getting it straightened out. No, our, our wonderful joy and, and happiness is that this has been accomplished, that this is our joy. And I don't, for me, I, I just, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm overly simplistic because my, my, my wife sometimes will say, well, don't you want to do this, that, or whatever? Or, you know, you got another eight, nine years in ministry. What are you going to do then? What do you want, what do you want to accomplish with your life? Sorry, I don't have a list. I, I don't have a list. I don't, I mean, travel. Uh, but yeah, I just don't really have a big list. And I'm sometimes thankful for that, that uh, I, I don't have to validate my life as far as being success. I like what Roy says. I know my savior. I got my family. I got my church. And I, I know my savior's done everything. So. Take, take, a, take a look at some of your older pastors. What do they do in life? They visit their families. They take look after their families. They look after their church. They get called on to be guest preachers and stuff. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of opportunities to continue to serve. Some are, are fit for that, want to do that. Others uh, want to just maybe stay put and help out wherever they can. So. Uh, the, the bonus material I'm going to save for next time, and, and uh, it really starts out with an interesting section on a personal confession with Pastor Hine and pastors about, and, and wow, this really cut, to because I, I see a lot of myself in this, how we as pastors measure success in our congregations. And wow, do we have to fight what we have in this bonus material about measuring by numbers and things like that. And I found that very worthwhile. And it's going to lead into a discussion about how do churches uh, resist that temptation to bend towards what the world will say is success. So uh, you look at the, the successful mega churches out there, what's our attitude towards that? And what's my attitude? And uh, yeah, the, the bonus material is, is just as useful as what we've gone through today and, and is going to at least take up another class that there's a lot of stuff in there. So we will spend some time with that. Uh, not Next week, we're actually not going to have Sunday morning Bible class because Pastor Boat, our mission counselor, is going to do a live Bible class. We're going to have it at church here, and he's got a topic chosen. So this will actually be two weeks from today. So just so you know, and I'll try to make you aware of that. And if you try to log in next week and it's not letting you in, it's not that I've forgotten or that I'm, or that I'm late and tardy and getting it set up. It's that we're doing the one live. So any, any other comments or, or questions on today's material? Anything else you have in mind? Is there any way that we can get on our computers and, and get the, the class? Uh, that's the thing we, you know, that it could be done with someone recording it on, on their phone. Maybe we can ask and see if someone willing to do that, or even with possibly with the camera, um, to do the Bible class. I can maybe check into that a little bit. That's something Roy, that's kind of first on my list to remedy. Uh, I've talked a little bit with, uh, Maggie Schoonover. They do a lot of internet stuff and I've talked to her a little bit and along with, uh, evangelism and elders, wherever, wherever it fits, 
about getting some cameras and getting them set up to where we are going to look into offering live streaming of our services. And until we get then for us to continue to do the evening ones uh, where I do it the night before, but that would also make it much you know, easier to record anything that we do in our sanctuary. So right now I can't make too any promises, but it is something I can maybe talk to some guys about if we could get even a, have a camera set up and then make it available and send it out. So just will not be at 930. So it, it won't be anything live. So as far as I know. Thank okay. you. Otherwise, happy Father's Day to you out there. Uh, let's go ahead and close with prayer, and I'll let you be on your way for this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather and once again to look at uh, the blessings that we have when we are able to succeed and things that we're, we're setting up as goals in our life, but also to keep it in perspective that our success should never be at the expense of trusting in you or having you first in our lives. So continue to remind us of where we failed. Let us know that we're forgiven in Christ again and again, and let us rejoice in the fact that you're going to work with us with the Holy Spirit to amend our sinful lives so that they may be more pleasing to you and more beneficial to us as we live here on this earth. Thank you for the blessing of fathers and all that they provide. And thank you for being our Heavenly Father. In your Son's name we pray. Amen.